Lord, help us to understand ourselves, not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think, but neither to think less of ourselves than we should. May we accept the dignity and the responsibility which properly belongs to such as we, who out of all creatures and all living things have come to the awesome, sometimes glorious, sometimes fatal status of being persons, and who as persons must not only exercise dominion in the realm of things, but also exercise dominion over our own selves and live in fellowship with one another and in reverence before thee. Let us not hide from what we are, nor turn away from becoming what we might be. We ask it in the name of Christ, through whom we have come to know thy good and gracious will. Amen. It is the intention of the Nobel Conferences to surround top-notch scientists with representative scholars from other fields of equal stature in order that the insights of each might confront one another, either to challenge or to clarify, or perhaps both. Since it is the nature of contemporary science developments to raise questions of moral and spiritual import, we've tried regularly to bring to this campus outstanding theologians and ethicists to reflect on the same sort of questions which were being dealt with by our visiting scientists. We're very pleased to be able to present to you now, as a part of this Nobel Conference, Dr. Daniel Day Williams, Roosevelt Professor of Systematic Theology at Union Theological Seminary in New York. My first acquaintance with Dr. Williams was as a member of an examining committee at the University of Chicago in which instance I think it was a question of whether I was going to pass muster. I'm glad to have had the occasion, in a sense, to serve on his examining committee with reference to this conference and to have decided that he did indeed qualify. We're delighted to have him speak to you now on the uniqueness of man, the prophetic dimension. Dr. Williams. President Carlson, ladies and gentlemen, I did indeed sit on your president's doctoral examination, and I have never forgotten it. And if I had any assurance that my performance would be in the same class of brilliance as his, I would be a much happier man at the moment. We are well into this conference, and the spirit of yesterday and of the lectures was so open and so stimulating that I'm going to make two rather informal remarks at the beginning this morning before a fairly formal presentation. They both grow out of the fact that I am asked to speak as a theologian um, in the midst of this group of scientists. My word dimension in my topic, the prophetic dimension, means exactly that. I want to try to look at a dimension of man's being, but use this word because this is not the whole of man's being. In other words, theology is not a substitute for the kind of scientific inquiry which we had presented yesterday. There are many sins of theology and theologians, but one of the greatest has been to treat theology as a kind of substitute for science, as if the real answers are here and not in the patient, humble kind of inquiry which we had demonstrated yesterday. So I mean to talk about a dimension of man's being, which 
needs to be looked at alongside the other dimensions which were discussed. My other remark has to do with the fact that we have moved back to this magnificent chapel from Alumni Hall. And I hope that I do not forget uh, in this chapel, which thrills me so deeply, I do not forget that what is said here this morning should be subject to exactly the same kind of rigorous criticism and testing and analysis that is appropriate in, shall I say, the secular precincts of Alumni Hall. And I have the, the very happy memory of this brilliant, lucid presentation of scientific inquiry yesterday morning by Father McMullen from this place. Man is the being who tells himself who he is. And that is why the answers to the question of man's uniqueness differ so widely. Man knows himself, but always with presuppositions. Some experiences are common to all of us. There is the human body with its growth, joy, sickness, and death. There are the processes of human thinking and acting and the universal traits of culture. We share a common fate as problems of hunger, transportation, crowding, nuclear war, and population explosion press upon us all. But what men make out of their situation and what kind of hope they have does not come simply out of the facts, but out of ways of seeing the facts. The second complication of man's attempt to say who he is concerns his being in process. Man is the being who knows he is becoming. He can trace something of his place in the evolutionary process. He writes his history. That history continues, and man is in it. Therefore, every answer to the question of who man is involves the reservation expressed in the biblical word, it doth not yet appear, what we shall be. A third factor in man's uniqueness is that man has freedom to reshape his own being, at least within limits. The existentialists have tried to say that the meaning of existence is something for man in his freedom to decide. The ancient text would have to be modified. It doth not yet appear what we shall make of ourselves. And in some sense, that must be true. It is man's uniqueness that he can either affirm or reject ways of being human. Thus, contemporary views of man range all the way from the evolutionary cosmic optimism of Teilhard de Chardin to the stoic despair of Jean-Paul Sartre. Man is a useless passion. This radical disparity in philosophic hope and despair is matched by the ambiguity of hopes and fears which now arise from scientific knowledge. During the past holiday in New York City, we entertained the American Association for the Advancement of Science. A reporter summed up his reaction to what he had heard thus, and I quote, no fundamentalist preacher ever prophesied doom for, more, for most people more emphatically than do some of the 10,000 members of the American Association for the Advancement of Science at meetings here this week. Yet they exhibit their holiday cheer in lobby greetings and at dozens of social gatherings. Visitors question, are they Stoics? Don't they believe one another? Or do they fiddle while Rome burns? This picture of the sophisticated community of scientists in cheerful concourse as they discuss the doom of environment pollution, population explosion, and atomic destruction gives a nightmarish quality to our search for meaning today. Never before have the possibilities of human control over the things that lay waste to life seemed greater. Yet never before have men had the imminent doom of all their works through their own self-destruction so clearly portrayed. In the search for some perspective and direction, there are some who say our problems are so new that ancient wisdom has nothing to tell us. Others fall back on the reiteration of past ways of thinking, whether or not they can see their relevance to contemporary life. 
I propose to explore one ancient perspective on man which may still illuminate the issues which confront us. I call it the prophetic dimension for two reasons. One is that its structure involves man's historical consciousness with his knowledge of past and future and the necessity of understanding himself as the being who is becoming. This historical consciousness is in part the contribution of the biblical prophetic tradition to our culture. The other reason for calling it the prophetic dimension is that it is the specific view of life which came to expression in the prophets of Israel and which underlies both the Hebrew Bible and the Christian New Testament. I have two main theses about it. First, that the prophetic dimension offers one relevant view of man's uniqueness. And second, that the prophetic dimension must be recognized in new contexts in the 20th century because of the extraordinary new powers which technological man has acquired. We need to take thought of ourselves in the light of our ethical and spiritual tradition but it is true we cannot simply reaffirm that tradition in all its old forms. Amos did not know about cybernetics, and Hosea did not understand the physical and psychological causes of schizophrenia. When Paul says the state must wield the sword, he's not dealing with the issues raised when the sword becomes an H-bomb. But there is a clarification in hearing the prophetic view of life in its own terms first and then asking what it can mean to us. There were five aspects of the prophetic view of man. First, man is the creature of the creator of all things. Man's life is bound up in a personal relationship with God, the Lord of life and history, who has created a good world and has made man in his own image to inherit, possess, and be fulfilled on the earth. Man's uniqueness reaches its peak not in the emergence of his intelligence and culture-creating power alone, but in his discovery that he is a responsible being, endowed with a freedom which he can use to serve God and his fellows or which he can misuse. For the prophets, conscience is as fundamental as consciousness for the understanding of the uniqueness of man. Man is unique among all creatures in that he bears the image of God. His spiritual dignity, therefore, is a reflection of his origin, and it brings its weight of responsibility with it. God has made of one blood all nations to dwell on the earth, hence responsibility of each man for the neighbor is universal. Second, man's spiritual greatness is the source of his deepest evil, and that is idolatry. Man's godlikeness tempts him to assume his divinity. The prophets see national life as the key to history. It is primarily nations and men as belonging to nations, which exhibit the self-serving pride which leads to monstrous evil. The specific sins of men are largely crimes against men, murder, exploitation, the arrogance of wealth, and the violence of power. Men comfort themselves with smooth words. They cry peace, peace, when there is no peace. Jeremiah suggests to the rulers of his day, you make a covenant with death, saying it shall not pass near us. When when righteousness and justice are made the measure, then your covenant with death shall be annulled and your agreement with Sheol will not stand. When the scourge passes through, you will be beaten down with it. That is, on the matter of death, the prophets see man as one who tries to avoid telling himself the truth about his own death, to make a covenant with it so that it will not touch him. A third aspect of the prophetic action and word is that the prophet himself is in the history for which he speaks the word of God's judgment and promise. The prophet's work was a response to God's call in the history in which he stood 
and the prophet bears this crisis and its meaning within his own life. He is but an instrument of the divine purpose, and he recognizes himself and his suffering within its action. He may be rebellious and unwilling. Jeremiah curses the day of his birth, but he lives in a history which is determined not by his individual wish or will, but by the will of God. His prophesying, therefore, is not something routine, nor is it a profession. It is characteristic of authentic prophecy that it is unpredictable and uncontrollable in its, in its appearance. It comes from the meeting of the Spirit of God with the consciences of certain men. The prophets are individuals. They stand in specific times and seek the meaning of God's word for their time and their people. They do not all see history in exactly the same way, nor do they all have precisely the same forms of hope. But they all see man as confronting the final issues of his life when he recognizes the claim of a divine goodness and purpose which he ignores at the peril of losing all that matters. The prophets do hope, and that is the fourth aspect of the prophetic dimension. Their people had experienced a redemption, a release from slavery, and the possibility of a new life in their own land. This pattern remains the theme of prophecy, but here the prophetic message reached its summit. Reliance on past achievement and on past security brings no salvation. It is the sin of nations to trust their own power and their claim to favor before God. Here the prophetic radicalness appears. All security lies in commitment to what God will do, not to what we have already enjoyed. Salvation lies in expectation of what the divine judgment and mercy will yet bring. This structure of future promise as the ground of salvation is more important than any special form of the prophetic hope. Sometimes the prophets spoke in near utopian terms with visions of universal peace and contentment. Sometimes they left the mode of the divine intervention unspoken. But in the later prophetic movement, the hope takes on a new form. It becomes messianic. God will raise up in history his own appointed servant to exercise divine power, establish justice, and bring peace. We see why those who understand man in the prophetic dimension can never accept salvation through progress or evolution or power over nature. The reason is not that these are not good things but that they put our confidence in the wrong place. The issue is the relation between man in his freedom and God in his claim upon the love and loyalty of his creatures. That issue can only be resolved when man himself receives a new heart. As the prophets see it, for man to trust in his own moral achievement is to trust in a broken and treacherous power. The saving way is acknowledgement that what we build cannot stand the judgment of a righteous God and he will have to rebuild. This prophetic messianism came to its supreme expression in the picture of the suffering servant in Second Isaiah. Whether the servant is a messianic figure himself or not remains obscure. In any case, he is the servant of God at the center of a history which is riddled with guilt. He bears its consequences in such a way that a new relationship between God and man is created. And here briefly I must turn a theological corner, because Christianity has always understood the prophetic message as preparation for the fulfillment of the messianic expectation in Jesus. I concentrate attention here on one point only that the prophetic dimension is not set aside in the Christian view that the Messiah has come, but is incorporated into the Christian faith and the Christian view of the future. My colleague Seymour Siegel of the Jewish Theological Seminary has put the two angles of vision, Jewish and Christian, perfectly. I quote him, the problem for the Jew is, since the world is in the condition that it is in, why does not the Messiah come? 
The problem for the Christian is, since the Messiah has come, why is the world in the condition it is in? The issue here lies at the root of all philosophies of history in the biblical tradition. And my thesis is that the Christian faith incorporates the prophetic dimension into its very affirmation that the Messiah has come. The extended defense of this view which should be given can only be summarized in the following points. First, Jesus himself continued the prophetic ethical message and preached the judgment and the promise of the kingdom. Second, the church has always asserted that Jesus fulfills the prophetic function because the church recognizes his office as prophet as well as priest and king. And since the Messiah has come in part as prophet, prophecy is not set aside, but is given a new foundation. And third, as the church lived through those first centuries after Christ, and as history went on, with men still living and dying, experiencing sin and grace, a new view of history had to be worked out. In the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, the beginning of the new age and the redeemed world is known, but it also points forward. We live between an already and a not yet. Paul saw the present time as the beginning of life in the new age, but not its consummation. The whole creation groaneth and traveleth in pain together until now. The vision of last things in the New Testament, book of Revelation, involves the divine proclamation again. Behold, I make all things new. So the Christian view of history is prophetic and eschatological. Faith has received a new foundation, but it also in its new form looks forward. Now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. We must say something about the prophet's view of nature, and too little attention has been paid to it. The Greeks were the naturalists of the ancient world, and much of our science we inherit from them, as Father McMullen so clearly told us. Have the prophets anything to offer but the limitations of an ancient worldview which we no longer hold? We must be careful not to try to modernize the prophets. They thought within the worldview of their age. They picture God as immediately controlling and miraculously intervening in events. Modern conceptions of natural processes, obeying discoverable laws, and developing through infinite time are foreign to them. Yet with all reservations, certain elements in the prophetic outlook are strikingly, strikingly suggestive to us now. Nature, for all its dependability we now know, is no fixed order with patterns which repeat themselves in endless cycles. Nature comes from the hands of God and serves his purposes as the prophets see it. Therefore, it is the scene of action, of passage, and it can be transformed. Everything in the created world is subject to the limitations of finitude, to passage, and death. But everything, by the same token, can be seen as offering some potential value to man as the dynamic life process goes on. Again, for the prophets, nature bears the mystery of creation. It is not self-explanatory. Man's attempts to read its secrets comes up against the limits of human understanding. It is not a sheer riddle, nor an arbitrary order, but its meaning is related to what God intends for man within the order of life. Therefore, there is always more to be known. The prophet's most radical idea is that nature itself is subject to God's redemptive action. It will be remade and reordered to fulfill the divine purpose. The words are almost too familiar, and we forget their power to release us from a fatalistic view of nature. God turns a desert into pools of water and a parched land into springs of water, says the psalmist. The animal world is included in the transformation. 
The wild beasts will honor me, and the jackals and the ostriches, for I give water in the wilderness. When we read the prophecy that every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill be made low, and that there will be a highway in the desert, we may even feel in the light of modern highway systems that we've been overdoing it. In any case, nature is the God-given environment for man's use. Jesus says, your heavenly Father knows you have need of all these things. This relation of man to nature, the rest of nature, is a critical issue today. We would not have modern science without the sense of nature as an order to be understood. And for that, we have both the Greeks with their rational genius and the Hebrews with their sense of the faithfulness of God to thank. But the Hebrews contributed something else, the sense of a necessary moral order in man's relationship to nature, an attitude which combines reverence before mystery with the sense of a purposeful life for all things. What nature will become is related to what man can become. And man will fail if he takes a purely exploitative attitude toward nature. Greed and the exploitative attitude combined can lead to wanton destruction of a countryside, of animal species, of the very possibility of a healthful life for man. The failure then to see a moral demand in nature, the failure to love it in all its mystery and beauty and even its terror, is part of man's failure to grasp the key to his own fulfillment. Science as an enterprise and attitude is not committed to the exploitative attitude, nor does it require it. Many scientists would strongly say the opposite. They would say that reverence and joy in the face of the great mystery is the most fruitful scientific attitude. But man using science and developing his technology may lose that moral sense for a humane and mutually fruitful relation between himself and nature which the prophetic dimension requires. But now I have summarized the prophetic dimension in these five points, and on the last one I've already anticipated because I've begun to speak about the possible relevance of the prophetic view to our present situation. And it is to that topic that I turn for the second part of this discussion. We can now ask the question, how would man in the 20th century be understood if we tried to see him with the guidance of the prophetic tradition? If the prophetic perspective has relevant light to throw on man, what does it reveal? At the outset, we see that the historical view of man, which has its roots in the biblical prophetic view, has become the almost inescapable presupposition of every outlook in the 20th century. Whatever else we know about man, we know he has to manage in the history of an evolving world and changing cultures. He must solve some collective problems of living on this planet, else life will be intolerable for most and perhaps for all. Almost no one today proposes that the lonely flight to the inner world or the seeking of the peace of eternity beyond time is sufficient. Man has to face his becoming in a world which has a history and where the shadow cast by the risks and possibilities of the future requires responsible action. This historical man is also technical man, armed with knowledge and powers which were unthinkable in earlier times. Some say these new powers make all traditional faiths and views of man's moral situation obsolete but let us see. There are important ways in which the issues of the technological age raise questions to which the prophetic outlook seems directly pointed. Perhaps the real question of our time is how man can understand himself and face his problems by incorporating his technological skill into a perspective which is founded on the deepest elements in the prophetic view of life. First, technology brings both threat and promise to man, not only for the higher achievements of culture, 
but for his very survival. The point is too obvious today to dwell upon, but the confirmation of the prophetic view that human powers are ambiguous in their significance could hardly be more convincing. Man himself is the most lethal and destructive creature evolution has produced. Unless he can manage to guide and control his technical processes, there is no reason whatever to think that he will avoid catastrophe with quite possibly the extinction of his life and perhaps all life on this earth. The ancient words of the Deuteronomist now have a literal and inescapable force. See, I have set before you this day life and good, death and evil. This crisis produced by technical power and knowledge means that the higher man's development of his power of controlling his environment, the more demands are placed upon his capacity for responsible concern. The self-restraining mastery of his passions is more urgent, not less. Some pictures of human development would make it appear that there is a gradual movement of man to higher and higher planes where his moral problems become resolved and he can breathe easier because he has reached such a high state of skill in dealing with all his difficulties. The very opposite seems to be the case. The greater man's powers, the greater threat he becomes to himself. The age of computers, missiles, and thought control demands a transformation of the human conscience if it is not to end in disaster. Not only do the technical powers require a prophetic interpretation, but the prophetic outlook must incorporate into its way of dealing with human problems the obligations derived from technical power. Most of the issues which are matters of critical importance for us today might be called moral technical. That is, they require both man's responsible valuations of human existence and persons and knowledge of the precise modes of relationship of man and nature which are disclosed by scientific inquiry. Moral issues tend to develop a technical dimension. For example, feeding the hungry has been a perennial moral demand. But the mode of, of providing an adequate agriculture is a problem of chemical knowledge, and getting that knowledge into use is a challenge to literacy, education, and political organization. By the same token, technical abilities create moral issues. The heart transplant raises the question of who is to have this service. By what principles of justice do you decide? The possibility of an almost unlimited production of standardized goods raises the question of the effect on human beings of the surfeit of such goods and the advertising campaigns necessary to sell them. This is why a prophetic ethic must concern itself with technical issues. Prophets have not always been strong on details, but we must be. It is an extension of the pro prophetic outlook then and not a contradiction of it to deal with the effects on human life of the new knowledge. Another example, the search for armaments control and the international policing of atomic weaponry involves man's survival. But the means of such control requires the most precise knowledge of physical processes and reactions, most of which may be understandable to the layman in their effects, but their creation and supervision requires the skill of a very few experts. I must not use the term technical knowledge here too narrowly, for there is a knowledge of the facts of life which in one sense is not scientific, but which brings to the issues of moral judgment a common sense understanding. Take the question of the rebuilding of the modern city to make it a place where people can live, breathe, converse, raise families, do work, and come to know their own souls. Cities have always been incarnations of human pride in the achievements of culture. And that is why the prophetic words of doom for the cities are so frequent. They see the divine judgment on civilization in the laying to waste of the cities. The 
Houses of the kings are torn down to make siege mounds. Famine, pestilence, and sword level these proud achievements of man. The prophets also express their hopes and visions of the rebuilt city, which shall be a name of joy and praise and a glory before all the nations of the earth. Now today, our cities are at the center of the human problem, and the issues are critical. Miss Jane Jacobs' title for her book has a prophetic ring, The Death and Life of Great American Cities. She knows that the problems of the city are, again, moral technical. Space for living is a moral problem. Every aspect of the laying out of the life of the city has its human repercussions. Planning for the new city is therefore not a violation of the prophetic outlook, but a requirement of it. How can we create livable space, buildings, homes, theaters, schools, so that men can live and breathe and work and play and learn to love one another? The answer to that question requires the technical knowledge of economists, planners, and architects, but it also requires common sense. Ms. Jacob asks, what is it that people really like about cities? and points out how important diversity and in the interests of the street and the chance to roam in interesting surroundings is. The new city requires, as we know so poignantly, the willingness of people to revolutionize a total social structure so that space and light, education and recreation can be made available for everyone and men can be together in a community of mutual respect and help. It may be, however, that the deepest problem posed by technology is the control of human behavior itself. Man can conceive the reshaping of his very mind and consciousness through instruments. This is a unique capacity, and it contains a unique threat. Here to me is one of the clearest demonstrations of the relevance of the prophetic dimension. Man can now plan his own dehumanizing and there are some who would like to carry it out. There is no assurance in human evolution that men will become more human, more free, more self-directed. Man can seek to divest himself of everything that fills human life with the risks and the surprises of existence. We need to face this question in the context of Auschwitz and Dachau, of the murders of civil rights workers, of the inhuman systems of exploitation of grape and tomato pickers. Man lives to control. So the promise of controlling others, even if it means their destruction, has its demonic attraction. The issue is the place of technical control in a genuinely human economy. Here again, to emphasize the prophetic claim of man's ultimate res moral responsibility for preserving freedom and the integrity of creative response is not a negation of the use of technical knowledge, but it is to put that knowledge in its place. For example, Dr. Carl Rogers, the psychologist, has insisted as strongly as anyone I know in present-day America on the importance of empirical knowledge of human behavior. He has pioneered in finding ways to document an accurate record of what happens when people engage in the exploration of the inner world. He has developed a highly technical set of concepts of what the therapeutic encounter may be. But he recently commented on tendencies in the behavioral sciences to make certain presuppositions about the control of human behavior, which he believes lead to dehumanization. He does not appreciate the prospect, and I quote, of an order in which men will be conditioned ants in a giant anthill. Psychology, like physics, can be used to enrich or destroy life. Rogers says pointedly, living is a form of not being sure and of not knowing what next or how. Man guesses, and he may be wrong, but then he does not know whom to befriend or for that matter, to marry. Rogers sees man's unending inquiry for truth as the discerning of the hidden elements of order 
embedded deeply in nature and experience. He quotes Banowski, order does not display itself of itself. There is no way of pointing a finger or a camera at it. Order must be discovered, and in a deep sense it must be created. What we see as we see it is mere disorder. We remake nature by the act of discovery in the poem or in the theorem. The decisive requirement then for a humane technology is the achievement of a view of man's relation to nature in which there are infinite possibilities of human discovery and creation, but there are also limitations imposed by the mystery of existence and by man's requirements for freedom, growth, and expression. The search for sheer self, for sheer control is self-defeating. Every teacher knows it, parents learn it. We have to rediscover that truth in each generation and especially now. Man's problems then are moral technical, but they are also political. Man is a political animal. Here the prophets and Aristotle agree. And here again, the prophetic perspective is being confirmed in the clash of nations and the search for a world order which can provide a tolerable mode of living together for the nations. The ambiguity of nationalism in its shaping of history runs all through the prophetic outlook, and it is being demonstrated anew today. The emotions and hopes of men are bound up with national destinies. In the developing new nations, national pride and power are essential for the emergence of personal dignity and a place in the world for multitudes of people. Man does not live by universal humanity alone, but by tradition and language and the sense of belonging in the group. Without the nourishment of personal life through the intimate group, the family and neighborhood, the larger community and the national community, Man cannot have the sensitivity, the sense of belonging, and the self-recognition which is required for creative living. Yet the ancient prophecy still stands against the temptation to make an idol of national power, to claim superior wisdom and righteousness for our group or nation. This people, which in some sense gives me my identity, my homeland, my chance of being effective in the world, this people which becomes my cause, almost inevitably makes a claim for an absolute devotion which can become uncritical and in which the power of my group against the other is made the goal of history. So political messiahs appear, sometimes in expectation, sometimes in the flesh. They appear as omniscient leaders, as demigods, as persons who are the incarnate symbols of national destiny. Their claims become fantastic. Their power feeds upon itself. No view of man which ignores the fanaticism of totalitarianism and the self-righteousness of national power can begin to cope with the facts of man's existence. Nkrumah of Ghana has had his downfall, but his inscription on the center of the capital city in Ghana stands for one of the demonically persuasive views of human life, seek ye first the political kingdom, and all these things will be added. The prophetic view here makes one of its most important contributions. It accepts the nation as God's people. And I think you can generalize that Old Testament idea for the whole of the nations. It sees history as determined by the relations not of individuals alone, but of nations to one another. The Hebrew prophets never rejected the notion of Israel's peculiar election as a nation. At the same time, they saw the divine judgment against every nation, including Israel. And they rejected utterly the attempt to make out of national power and success the equivalent of the fulfillment of life under God. If the prophetic view is right, then it should be possible for us to discover both the greatness and the limits of national life. We can learn the meaning of nationhood 
and of belonging within a national political tradition without making an idol of our group and its power. It's a sober fact of history that this is going to take more than mature self-criticism. The necessities of survival in a world where others are armed with the same means of destruction has its own way of teaching us what we need to know. So we proceed partly by moral discernment and partly by the stark realities of history. But if by the prophetic dimension of man's uniqueness, we understand that view which sees man discovering his membership in the family of many peoples and seeking a viable justice and peaceable order among them, then the prophetic dimension is authenticating itself. In 1960, Eugene Rabinowitz, writing in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, was willing to push that scientist clock back to a few more minutes before 12, on the ground that this new collective consciousness is penetrating our world. I quote him, it is a sober fact that in our time, the survival and prosperity of any individual or group is becoming more and more obviously tied up with the well-being and security of mankind. No nation has either the moral right or the objective possibility of existing indefinitely as an island of prosperity in a sea of want." End of the quotation. But I have to say, on the day in which I wrote that paragraph about turning the clock a few minutes earlier before 12, Rabinovich was quoted in the New York Times as saying that now he had to turn it back closer to 12. We have taken notice then of the prophet's involvement in the history to which he announces the divine judgment. His word is not a professional pronouncement. He doesn't choose the role. He is called against his will. He protests his guilt and inability, as does Isaiah. He curses the day he was born to such responsibility, as does Jeremiah. And as the prophetic movement develops, the prophet himself, in his own loneliness, his suffering and his anguish, becomes, along with his people, the bearer of the pain of the divine judgment. The prophetic view of politics, this means, requires commitment at the risk of power, position, and prestige. There is no way to the responsible meeting of contemporary issues other than sharing the political struggle. This means that the ethical way requires more than adopting a moral attitude, however sensitive and well-considered it may be. It means to act in history, to assume its burdens, and to bear the consequences. The greatness of man, then, is not only in the sensitivity of his conscience, but in the willingness to risk the resentment, the disfiguration which occurs when he acts according to conscience, to make himself a reproach as he shares in the moral burden of history. The atomic scientists became politicians at the outset of their project and in its aftermath. Or to take another example, a prophetic involvement. Eric Erickson remarks that Luther and Freud each did the dirty work of his generation. And it's to Dr. Erickson, the psychoanalyst, that I turn for another example of the prophetic dimension in a contemporary perspective. Erickson's address to the Psychoanalytic Association in 1961 on psychological reality and historical actuality is directed to the role played by psychiatry in the modern period. It is a plea for a recognition of the psych by the psychologist of his responsibility in history. Psychology, he tells his colleagues, has had a share in creating the romantic optimism which hopes of an id utopia to be arrived at through the release of infantile sexuality. He calls on his profession to assume a new responsibility in culture. But Erickson goes deeper as he asks what has contributed to the reluctance of the psychiatrist to see the struggle for power in history as a source of dynamism and of evil. And he concludes that one source has been the psychologist's own reluctance to recognize this aggressive drive in his own professional activity. Here is the prophetic turn to the conscience. Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, 
and I dwell amidst the people of unclean lips. Erickson takes note of Robert Oppenheimer's use of the word sin to describe man's fall into the corruptions of justice and human decency. Here, the language of secular prophecy, beginning with issues of contemporary professional responsibility, becomes the language of traditional prophecy. I am not trying to say for a moment that Erickson would reinstate the traditional perspective as I have been pleading for it, but only to recognize that the prophetic pattern can recur and does in our time as men grapple with their contemporary responsibilities. This prophetic word you will notice in its contemporary form is not spoken apart from technical understanding, but it makes use of that understanding. Erickson draws upon his psychological knowledge of repression in order to call his colleagues to a deeper assumption of responsibility in history. This welding of prophetic judgment to scientific understanding is something new in human history. The ultimate issues still lie in man's moral assumption of responsibility, his acknowledgement of the evil he does, his resolve to seek a wider justice. But those issues require him to know himself with every resource of modern knowledge. Technical knowledge does not create the prophetic outlook but it may immeasurably contribute to its effectiveness. I come then to the last and the profoundest issue which the prophetic pr perspective raises for men today. Is man unique in the world as its only spiritual inhabitant, finding his way alone to adjust to his natural environment, dependent wholly upon his own resources for wrenching some meaning out of this strange material of life. The prophets do not see man that way. The sources of hope and renewal do not lie in man alone because his uniqueness is a reflection of the image of his creator. His hope lies not only in what he can make out of life, but in the creative power which remakes man's life and consciousness and offers him a hope founded upon the eternal and ever gracious source of his being. Now, in a full discussion of the prophetic standpoint, I should, of course, give fullest attention to the concept of God. And the prophets leave us many problems about God, since they speak and think within the ancient worldview and its supernatural structure, its tendency to see extraordinary intervention as God's primary mode of working, and the too simple equation of suffering with moral punishment. The prophets did not have the modern view of nature, nor the conception of an eternally creative life which is manifest in the great sweep of evolutionary history. But the prophets do know God as living, present, creative spirit. They see God entering into an adventure with his creatures in their freedom and as establishing a personal covenant with them bearing with them in their groping, their failures, and their hopes. They think of God as setting limits to man's evil, and the manifestation of those limits is the divine judgment. They think of the future as holding in store a new act of God in which his kingdom will come through his own power and will. But they always think of that future act of redemption as conforming in meaning to the previous acts in which God has set men free. Its meaning is bound up with the divine purpose in history and man's response to it. In the last resort, the prophets are not concerned with pictures of the new age. These are prophecies, but they are not prophetic. They are concerned with the trust and hope which belong to those who believe that with God a new order is possible and that it will fulfill the ultimate need of men for righteousness and peace. Therefore, in the prophetic perspective, the uniqueness of man is understood only when we see that it is the God relationship which makes a man a man, as Kierkegaard says. Man is the God-seeking creature. Now, just here, let us notice the prophets aren't much concerned about religion. Indeed, if religion means comfortable feelings of being on the divine side or impressive ritual observance, or the prestige and power of religious institutions, the prophets are unimpressed. 
Their message is sometimes one of down to, downright rejection. Amos, I hate, I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. But if religion means that man bears within himself the question as to who he is, where he comes from, and to whom he is beholden, then man cannot fulfill his humanity without discovering who God is. In that sense, man is the religious animal, and the question about God will burn within him forever. The recent episode of the death of God thinkers certainly indi indicates a widespread dissatisfaction with the repetition of ancient formulas for God's relationship to the world. But it also seems to show that the announcement that there is no God is but the prelude to, more, to a more intensive search for that ultimate reality in which man's life is set. And that is just the question about God. Now, believing as I do that an interpretation of the prophetic message in our time requires a rethinking of the conception of God's relationship to the world, of God's relationship to time, of God as becoming as well as being, of God's relationship to natural law, all these problems. It would be quite tempting here to plunge in to those issues upon which I will say, it seems to me, Alfred North Whitehead among the philosophers has the most light to throw. But there is no time for that, and we are talking about man. And so what I want to do for just a moment is to try to answer the more practical question, perhaps, of what difference faith in the God of the prophets makes to our conception of our uniqueness and our destiny. Among the many views of man today, I want to try to contrast two. They're not the only ones, but they're both contemporary. They're both concerned with man in the scientific and technological age. They are both realistic, combining hope with a knowledge of the risks of freedom. They are both authentic expressions of human conviction and disciplined belief. I shall call them the way of the self-transforming humanist and the way of the celebrating servant. The self-transforming humanist has learned that humanity is involved in a long evolutionary development and that man has power to understand, reshape, and direct some of its processes. Man's task now is to realize his fulfillment through the exercise of his natural and yet unique capabilities. I am thinking here of Lewis Mumford, surely of one of, the, one of the most profound and most informed of the humanists of our time. Mumford does not believe in any automatic progress. In his book, The Transformation of Man, he writes bluntly of the impending degradation of man to a power-serving automaton, I quote, if the goal of human history is a uniform type of man reproducing at a uniform rate in a uniform environment kept at constant temperature, pressure, and humidity, all inward way waywardness brought into conformity by hypnotics and sedatives, a creature under constant mechanical pressure from incubator to incinerator, most of the problems of human development would disappear. Only one problem would remain. Why should anyone, even a machine, bother to keep this kind of creature alive? Mumford believes that what man must achieve is what he has never yet accomplished, the affirmation of his wholeness, to realize the many-sidedness of his nature in its bodily, mental, sexual, artistic, technical, and emotional aspects. The man who can live in this new age, which is coming to birth, must renounce perfection in any single field for the sake of balance and growth. Mumford says the self we seek, one that will have a heightened consciousness of its own still unused resources, has still to be created. In the fullness of time, a unified self will bring a world culture into existence, and that world culture will in turn sustain and bring to a higher pitch of development this new self. Mumford thus calls for human effort 
directed by a new philosophy of wholeness. And this effort to create the new civilization should claim our energies and our devotion. Now surely here is the uniqueness of man stated with no nobility of purpose and openness of mind. Mumford has no blueprint for the future. He recognizes that man is cooperating with integrating processes and with the promptings of divinity within him. His view is Faustian in its heroic optimism about man. It is sane, humane, and dedicated in its search for the deeper springs of human action. Who could conceive a finer or more sensitive vision of man realizing his unique capabilities? And yet, something makes us pause. Is it only the echo of an ancient warning that man cannot count on his own perceptiveness and goodness? Or is it the knowledge of what man has done to man with the brutality, the horror, the hatreds which divide men? and the great and as yet unsolved problems of human living together. There is an alternative form of faith for man. The celebrating servants find themselves saying yes to life, not because they see the way to wholeness or because they are drawn by the prospect of such a civilization in the future, good as these things are. They say yes to life because they find its meaning in God's work in the midst of the present tragic and comic circumstances. They do not depend upon the assurance of wholeness for man. They depend on the discovery that the broken fragments of human effort are yet good and whole when they incorporate the love of life and faith in the gracious working of God. This is the prophetic dimension of hope. It believes that God uses what man discards, that suffering with the agony of mankind is the only way to peace, and that it has a glory for him who lives by faith. And so the servants celebrate life while they work at it. They believe in an unimaginable good in the future, even when they cannot see it coming. They are servants not as a term of self-congratulation, but because they see all good as a gift from the source of life, which is not man but God. I am thinking here of another of the great citizens of our time, Dog Hammarskjöld. He was something of a Renaissance man himself in his abilities and tastes. He would understand Lewis Mumford's call for the wholeness of life, the uniting of emotion and intellect, the love of mountain climbing, the delight of friendship, he worked at the center of the political effort of the nations to find some way of peaceable and tolerable community with one another. But instead of offering a broad philosophy for the transformation of man, he left us only a set of fragments, markings or scratchings. But in them we catch the accent of a way of being fully human and of saying yes to life, which expresses the faith that man is the servant of God and that the meaning of life is in accepting that service with its demands while we do not know the end. He says there are actions justified only by faith which can lift us into another sphere where the battle is with principalities, dominions, and powers, actions upon which out of mercy everything is staked. For the holy life is our way and your adorable patience the road by which we must approach thee. He joins this note of celebration to the note of strenuousness and of peace in the midst of the unfinished business. As he says, to love life and men as God loves them for the sake of their infinite possibilities, to wait like him, to judge like him without passing judgment, to obey the order when it is given and never look back, then he can use you, then perhaps he will use you. And if he doesn't use you, what matter? In his hand, every moment has its meaning, its greatness, its glory, its peace, its coherence. In this prophetic perspective, man's most important capacity is not his dream of being fully realized in a new civilization 
but his capacity to give thanks on the way to it. It's courage to do what needs to be done when he is surrounded by darkness and his possibility never to lose heart. In the prophetic view, man's hope is most securely founded when it expresses his celebration of a life to which he says yes in the midst of its good and its evil. Man's uniqueness finds its fulfillment in this, that he can recognize and trust in a goodness which is at work in all things, which works in strange ways, and which holds an even greater promise for every time and every future than man can conceive or plan. Thank you for having brought these ancient insights so close to the concerns of our time. Now you are invited to address such questions as you may have to our speaker. Write them on the notes that have been given you. The next session is at 1.30 in Auditorium Hall. The ushers will pass down the aisles to receive the questions that you may have to ask. There are two questions which, uh, in a sense, are the same question, and they both have to do with the problem of a literal prediction of, of things to come. One is, do you think that the end of our world be, will be a destruction of many Sodom and Gomorrahs, or will the end of the world come as a reward for man because he has achieved a unified noosphere as Teilhard would have it? I think within the perspective that I'm trying to develop this morning, the answer to any literal question about what is going to happen to this particular world or to man's life in it is something we do not have and something which is not given, and in my view, something which is not even yet decided. It is if you really believe in freedom, then man's freedom uh, to end his adventure on this earth at the present time seems to be possible. Individuals take their lives, and it is not impossible that man would take his own uh, collective life. This is one possible end, but there is no uh, way of predicting that that will happen. And if one believes in God and freedom, there's no need to believe that it must happen. On the matter of achieving a unified noosphere, as Teilhard would have it, let me make one or two comments about this. I didn't want to take the time in the paper for it, but my own view is that while Teilhard prophesies, he does not stand within the prophetic dimension quite as I understand it, because he tends to think of this movement of life and of all things toward one final direction as somehow guaranteed in the nature of things. I may misunderstand him there, but I don't believe that I do. And uh, precisely what I was trying to develop this morning was the prophetic view that we have no guarantees that God is going to fulfill our life in a particular way. What we have is the guarantee that God will fulfill life in a way which is appropriate to his purpose and to our response so that any notion that we achieve or by some processes in which we are involved are, are participating in a kind of assured progress toward a uh, completely fulfilled end, I think contradicts not only the prophetic perspective, but our deepest sense of, of the real risks of freedom and of the real openness of history as man lives in it. 
The other question, would you please comment on the literal interpretation of the prophets as proposed by Emmanuel Velikovsky, that is, a literal, specific, uh, cosmic event in which this uh, world comes to an end. And here again, I would give the same answer. I don't think that the prophetic outlook is concerned with literal predictions of this kind. We do not know what the shape of the future is. The question is the spirit, the obligations, the responsibilities uh, with which we move into it. Now I have a question which I am grateful for um, because it raises the question of what theology is about and whether we need it. In regard to their moral and political involvement, speculations in theology have often re resolved themselves through egocentric pride into untenable and superstitious dogmas that have done untold harm to man in his search for truth. Since these speculations are often purely imaginary excursions of thought as regards the unknown, and therefore without factual foundation or proof, should not theology be rather concerned with and concentrated on overcoming man's superstitious fears, his prejudices, his feelings of doubt, anxiety, and inferiority by giving him faith and belief in his own abilities and potentialities. Um, we theologians are used to this. Um, I warmed up for the conference by attending a lecture by Professor Wheeler of Princeton, uh, the physicist, and he came to the end of his lecture he's describing the explosions of the novae and uh, this mystery when the explosion goes inward and the energy disappears into what he called a black hole. He said, we come here to all most theological questions. I would use that word, except it's such a bad word, is what he said. Well, of course, I want to reply to this without any defensiveness, professional otherwise, at all. Um, of course, theology carries a very heavy burden of guilt for uh, projections, illusions, uh, arbitrary dogmas. But I want to make perhaps three comments about it. One is that it's a fact and we need to face it. Second, that running through theology from the beginning, there has been a counter strain that man cannot identify his own ideas with God, that theology is as much a pointing to the mystery as it is an unraveling of it, and it is precisely theology's business to become the, critics, uh, the critic of two sure uh, assumptions that we, know, that we know the truth about ourselves or about God. Now, I think that's part of theology's important business. So I do not accept the view that it's only a projection of illusions. Um, theology is the attempt to think about the reality of life on the basis of certain events and experiences which are taken to be illuminating of the whole of it. And the third remark is somewhat polemical. It is not only theology which falls into the sins of dogmatism and pride and illusion. Uh, these are human failings, not just theological failings. We all ought to be aware of them. Do you believe God is the ultimate reality? If so, wouldn't this be a blind faith? For to recognize the ultimate reality, you yourself would have to possess these qualities. How do you think the history book... Well, let me take that first question. The other is different. Do you believe God is the ultimate reality? If so, wouldn't this be a blind faith? For to recognize the ultimate reality, you yourself would have to possess these qualities. First of all, um, we're in a metaphysical problem here. Do you believe God is the ultimate reality? I don't want quite to say it that way. God is the ground of ultimate reality, or God is involved in all reality. God is ultimate in that sense. But if this means God is the only real reality there is, and I think this is what the questioner perhaps is getting at, there's, there's really nothing but God, then I think knowing God might be a kind of self-divinizing. That is, the, the point of the question would be valid. But neither the Christian view nor the modern metaphysical view that I referred to would say that God is the only reality. God is ultimate in being in the sense of being that reality 
which is involved in and creative of every other reality. But he's not the only reality there is. That's what the reality of the world means. God has real creatures. So that now the question is transformed. Is it possible for finite creatures to recognize that reality uh, which, upon which they depend? And my answer is yes, precisely because we do depend upon it. There's no contradiction in saying that we remain finite, but we re recognize ourselves as dependent upon something which has infinite dimensions. How do you think the history book, Bible, we worship should be interpreted? Uh, I can't quite answer it in that form because I do not worship the Bible and I do not believe uh, either uh, Hebraic or Christian faith worships the Bible. We worship the God whose word gave rise to the witness that we have in the Bible. But let me still meet the question, how should it be interpreted? Well, if I may dare to say so, I was trying to give an example without an answer to that this morning. It should be interpreted by asking again, what is the central meaning here and what sense does it have when you look at all of life in the light of it? I don't know any other way to go about biblical interpretation than that. Of course, we need the historical critical tools, but when we ask for its meaning, we are asking, what is it that is being talked about here? What is the sense of it? And now, how do you look at all the rest of human experience in the light of it? Um, that's interpretation. So that interpretation is not simply a matter of reading the meaning out of the text as if it just comes from heaven and there it is. It's a matter of wrestling with the meaning in relation to the whole of life. And that is why, that is why the biblical word requires our knowledge of science, knowledge of history, and that struggle with, struggle with truth wherever, wherever we encounter it. Why is man a God-seeking being? Why does man need a higher being to rely upon when all other animals have no such need? Well, again, I hate, again, to quarrel with the question, but I think the animals need God just as much as we do, and in one sense, perhaps more. Um, that is, if God doesn't take care of them, nobody's going to um, very much. That is, um, there is an old question about the religious experience in animals. Uh, I think it's a, either an unanswerable or a, just a delightful uh, speculative question. Um, no, animals don't have any consciousness of being dependent upon a, an ultimate reality, but they are dependent, and uh, they, need, they need a world which has a structure, which has a creative process, which has possibilities of adjustment to environment, the ongoing of life, just as we do. But now why does man, why is man a God-seeking being? Why does man need a higher being to rely upon? Of course, in one sense, the answer is not what he needs, but what he has. Uh, he is dependent. He is in a context. But the question goes deeper than that. Why should man seek a spiritual reality, a, a, a God in the midst of this natural environment? I think I'd have two answers to that, very briefly. First of all, because man's trying to know himself. I think this came out very clearly yesterday. Man's search for his own self-knowledge drives him back to questions about where he comes from and what he's related to. Man is not shut up to his own self-consciousness. Man comes to self-consciousness in a strange, threatening, interesting world which does all kinds of things to him and with him. Who is he? The question about God is the question, what is this other in and through all things? What is this reality which brings me forth and with which I have to do? This is why man is a God-seeking being. Now that's first. 
But second, man is a God-seeking being because whenever he tries to pin the meaning of his life on himself alone and what he can achieve and create, be satisfied with, he discovers sometime, somewhere, that it won't do. Now that statement I can't prove. I think that's a problem about life. Is that true or not? If you try to make yourself the meaning of your existence, if you try to be satisfied with what you can create, you can do, somewhere at some time it breaks down. And the question about God is, is there some good, some reality, which you are dependent upon but which you don't control, which can fulfill what you cannot fulfill? Now that does not mean, let me say, that does not mean that what we create, what we do, our effort is meaningless, not at all. It means that man is the being who must finally find some meaning which is not dependent upon himself alone, else he falls into despair. And I think Jean-Paul Sartre is being extremely honest, and extremely uh, courageous when he says, the fact about all of man's creations is they die, they pass away, there's nothing final about them, so man is a useless passion. Now something in man keeps him from allowing himself finally to say to himself that he's a useless passion. And that something, whatever it is, is not what he puts there, but it's something that's there, and that's God, whatever name he may give to it. Do you see any conflict between your understanding of the prophetic view of life, the experience of faith, and the modern understanding of how we experience the world around us? I'm grateful for that question. You know when you write one of these lectures ahead of time and then sit and listen to others, you go through a certain agony because uh, things occur to you. And this is one of the questions that occurred to me, especially last night in Sir John's lecture. Let me, for the purposes of discussion, we're going to have a chance for discussion a little later today, suggest there is perhaps at least an issue to be discussed. Because in the prophetic view of life, man is not shut up to his own consciousness. What is fundamentally given is man's experiencing self, I'm borrowing the word now, if I may, man's experiencing self in relation to um, his fellows, in relation to God, in relation to the world outside. This is what is given. Man is the being who is always addressed from beyond himself. Now the prophets were not only scientists, but they weren't epistemologists, and they weren't modern philosophers. They hadn't heard of Descartes. Um, they're not arguing. Uh, the I think, therefore I am uh, issue. But I would, I would say there is something in the prophetic view which resists the view that man's one ground of certainty is his own awareness of himself. His ground of certainty for the, for the prophets is his being addressed from beyond himself. And that, that may raise, uh, that raises uh, some very interesting problems, and perhaps we get a chance uh, to talk, to talk uh, about them. But again, may I say, you don't solve epistemological problems of this kind just by adopting a prophetic perspective. You enter into a dialectic, a dialogue between this way of thinking and what modern philosophy and science have to say, and this is, this is the process. Other speakers this week have said that religion and myths were developed when men realized that life on earth was terminal, and that unless he had something to look for beyond his physical death, life would be absurd. 
Do you think we can have meaning in life without any hope for the future beyond physical death? I think it's a gap in my paper that I did not discuss that question, and especially since the issue of death has been put so sharply by Dr. Dobzhansky and others. <clears throat> uh, there are two parts of the question. First of all, let me say one word about myth. I don't know that Father McMullen or others said that it is only death that produces the, the myths, and I think that would not be true. Some of the myths celebrate the, uh, the renewal of life uh, in each season. No one can say that this is bound up with death, and in a sense it is. Uh, some of the myth, myths celebrate uh, the return of health uh, beyond illness. Some of them simply celebrate the group and its life and tradition, so that I, I don't know that anyone would want to say the only source of myth is man's uh, sense of death. And as a matter of fact, a great many of the myths offer no specific notion of immortality at all. Um, they deal with the future in all kinds of ways, but the myths are not necessarily that kind of answer to the question about death. But now, do you think we can have meaning in life without any hope for the future beyond physical death? Of course, man is the kind of being, he can find all kinds of meanings, and I, I think I'd have to say yes. Men can find meanings in life, they can find meaning in the moment, meaning in memory, meaning in tradition. Uh, David Hume died, that uh, was reported very serenely. Hume had no, no faith, apparently, beyond this, and. Dr. Johnson was told that Hume had died, this atheist, with such serenity, and Dr. Johnson said, he lied. <laughs> well, uh, I've always believed that wasn't fair to David Hume, but uh, I think he probably could. Yes, men can have meaning of various kinds. Um, but in a deeper sense, my own view would be that some kind of hope for the future beyond physical death is very close to the meaningful life. What kind of hope? How we can spell this out, or whether we should try? This is, the, this is another question. But the believer in God hopes, because God lives. God is not, God becomes, but God, that is, God doesn't have a beginning and an ending. God is bound up in history, and he reacts to it, but God doesn't begin or end. So that whatever life is, whatever it contributes, whatever its meaning becomes, it is carried on in the ongoing life of God forever. That kind of hope I think we need, and it gives a dimension of meaning to life which is very important. But I wouldn't say that even that every man has to have in order to find some meaning. From which publication of Carl Rogers were you quoting? It is an article in the last issue of Pastoral Psychology, and if the person who asked this will just speak to me, I think I can give you the exact reference, but I don't have it in front of me. It's called Some Reflections on the Behavioral Sciences. Yes, what is your view on how the story of Adam and Eve fits in with the theory of man's evolutionary development? Could this biblical story of man's origin occur during the same period as the qualitative gap described by Dr. Dobzhansky? You know, I think it's very important here to say uh, we don't know just how the story of Adam and, Eve, Adam and Eve fits with the evolutionary picture, not for the sake of protecting some little literalism about the story, but because the Adam and Eve story is a myth about origins. And this is what is hidden, and this is what I heard yesterday, uh, it seems to me, that the origins are hidden, they're in mystery. And this strange and wonderful story of Adam and Eve deals with several aspects of the origins. The origin of man, the origin of sex, the origin of, of guilt, the origin of anxiety, the origin of temptation, the origin of work. I mean, if you think of the richness of this, of this story, um, it, um, 
it's, it's a permanent part of our equipment in trying to understand ourselves. But that doesn't mean that you can, uh, that you can or that you need just directly to say, well, now this happened in a certain way at this qualitative gap. You've got the problem of, of, uh, of single origin, for instance, which it seems to me is a, uh, is a scientific problem. I mean, what, is, there, is there one, is there or was there one single pair uh, at the beginning of this qualitative gap? It would be interesting to ask the scientists they would say about that, but uh, if they say they don't know, it doesn't, it doesn't change your view of the story and its importance. Uh, it's simply one of the scientific problems. So I would, I would not want to try to use the myth to fill in a gap in the evolutionary scientific picture at all, but to use the myth as one of the ways in which man has reminded himself of this strange and wonderful fact of his spiritual existence his temptation of the ambiguity which comes when he knows good and evil and of his sin and of his need for God. <laughs>